Can you hear me now? Well, that's annoying. Am I echoing? Okay. 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 Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> I'm sure I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm recording, recording for you. For you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay, can you hear me? Okay, so there's a thing called a mute button on the computer <laughs> that really is important that you unmute yourself before you start <laughs> before you start a meeting. <laughs> yeah, okay. So anyway, well Oh, I'm glad I started a little early. Okay, so this is the thing. I have a, I tried to start on time so that we can get through everything. Um, I have a soccer match that's an hour and a half away. So at the very least, I have to leave, I have to cut this short at 110. If we're deep in conversation, then I, I can always just put it on my phone and we can continue like that way. Okay, if there's, if you know there's something that's bugging you or you know we just can't complete so that'll give me at least five minutes to get my hair up and change so i can go to the soccer game um before we start okay let's go over it it's 58 58 points and the test is on monday and it is paper okay it's going to be over the respiratory system i generally do not test on the anatomy of the respiratory system, okay? Um, you know, like, I, I just, we're past that. You already took anatomy and physiology. So we'll just test on what is important about nursing. Also, other than, I can't, other than, like mucolytics, um, antitussives, um, you know, how does codeine affect, you know, the body? I don't test on, and rifampin, I'd say, I don't test on the different antibiotics. Like is augmentin better for strep or anything like that? Because every antibiotic is different. Um, and I really think it depends on the doctor and what he prescribes. What one person would prescribe um, amoxicillin, the next one would do augmentin. Okay, just as long as you know it's, you know, we're doing broad spectrum, that's most important. But like antitussives, um, it's important to know when are we going to do an antitussive? When are we going to do a mucolytic? Okay, when are we going to give more fluids? When don't we want to give fluids? Okay, so need to know that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of it's just nursing care, okay? And how are you gonna take care of your patient? How are you gonna get them better? So that being said, is anybody dying 
Like, is there anything in particular that you're worried about? Or do you want me to hit the highlights? I think generally ABGs, you guys are pretty good on the ABGs. Except for that last question on the quiz, you know, um, which was about, um, I think the patient was in metabolic alkalosis. What did they, you know, what did they have too much of? So what do you think? You wanna start from the beginning? I should make you guys all sit there and let me see your pretty faces because you have to deal with my bad hair day. I call it my 80s hair. Okay. <laughs> Dalen. <laughs> okay. Another thing before we start um, to the beginning. Um, when you guys, and everybody's a little different, but make sure, how can I put this? I will do it. I'll just say this. I was a um, flashcard fool when it came to studying. So like if I'm talking about pleuritis, I would have on one side of the flashcard what pleuritis, the word pleuritis. On the flip side, I would have the signs and symptoms of pleuritis. Do yourself a favor, test yourself on the knowledge that you have, okay? I think that's the only reason flashcards worked for me is because I was able to test my knowledge. It never worked for me to have it all written out and just go and yeah, I have that. Because I tell you what, I'm kind of lazy like that and I'll look at it and I'll read it and I'm like, yeah, I got that or I got that. Okay, make sure you test in your knowledge. That's why I put those quizzes up there so you can test your knowledge to see what you know, what you don't know. Aw, what a cute little kitten. Those little things are just, when you're trying to do work, they're rough. Okay, but test what you know, what you don't know. Just don't read the book and say, yep, I got everything. Okay, because what's gonna happen is in the middle of the test, you're gonna sit there and you're like, ooh, do I know it or do I not know it? And I think that's what happens a lot of times is that you, you know, you get in a test, so your anxiety's up. Then there's words on the test that increases your anxiety, right? And then we're asking you to differentiate the two different um, diagnoses. And that's when you start second guessing yourself. But if you know the information, that should bring down your anxiety just a little bit, okay? Now I have clinical tomorrow between, you know, seven to seven, seven to seven, six thirty to seven. If you have any questions, I'm sure my Monday clinical group won't mind if you know you guys have questions and maybe we break off about six o'clock and we can get on Zoom and answer those questions. Of course, I I'm not talking about my if my Monday group will highly hate to leave clinicals a little early. You know, I know how much they love clinicals and especially right before a test, right? So I would hate to upset them and let them leave a little early before a test because, you know, that's how they are. Okay, so what, if you have any questions after this, make sure you write them down and what I might do is throw out maybe an announcement tomorrow, which is really cool because you can reply to the announcements on Canvas. And if you would like to meet for a little bit tomorrow night, let me know, okay? Um, if you have any questions dur during the day, please let me know. I'm hoping that we like discharge all the COVID patients and that we have a full unit in my wildest dreams, because it seems like more and more, um, we're getting more and more positives. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Let me share my screen. Uh, we'll start with the upper respiratory. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through, 
Can you guys see me? Hold on. Oh, there you are. Hold on. Can you see the screen? Okay. Well then, let me move you out of here and we put this as a full screen. I was afraid. I kind of lost you guys. Okay. Epistasis, remember, nose is very vascular. So anything that can hurt the nose, we're going to have nosebleeds, right? That's why, because it's vascular, that's why, well, let's face it, people like to, sh you know, snort cocaine because it's highly vascular. But also, it's reason why we give Narcan in the nose. Uh, we can also actually give... Um, nitro in the nose and we can do there actually came out with insulin in the nose believe it or not um but i'm sure that's really really expensive so is the nitro so what are we worried about with what's the biggest thing we're worried about when we're talking about epistasis the most common i know we sit there and we say about you know if it's clear drainage then we're looking for cerebral spinal fluid but what else are we worried about if we had a patient that had um, a bloody nose, what's the biggest thing that we're worried about with that patient? Go back to your ABCs. The aspiration. Aspiration's good. And what could an aspiration lead to? Pneumonia. Well, before that. Like it's a sign and symptom of pneumonia, but what else could it lead from for, to when you talk about aspiration? How would you know that they aspirated? Their lung sounds. Lung sounds. What else? Don't go too airway. deep. What was that? Airway. A pass airway. airway. So how would you know about the airway? Um, their respirations are increased. Okay, and what else? <clears throat> if the respirations are increased, what would be decreased? O2. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so when you're talking about somebody with, um, with a bloody nose, one of the things that we're going to look for is the fact that they have maybe their SpO2 is a little bit lower. Okay, and it can, and we want to catch it early. Okay. So if their SpO2 is down to 89%, but when they came to us, they were 95, we're going to take, we're not going to sit there and like, oh, that's okay. No problem there, right? But that is a problem. So we're definitely going to look at the, the as, aspiration. We're going to make sure that they're um, O2. Remember, go back to your ABCs, okay? Um, the biggest thing is pinching the head forward five to 10. And then we can apply ice for vasoconstriction, okay? I'm not going to ask you about the cocaine or anything like that, but those are different ways that we can um, combat uh, nosebleeds, okay? Um, I, I got nothing, okay? We're not going to do anything for a nosebleed except try to stop the nosebleed, okay? If there's any trauma, um, if they're gonna, if it's like smeared to the side of their face, then we're gonna probably take them to the surgeon and reduce that. But other than that, the biggest thing for us to worry about, and the biggest thing for your, for you to worry about on your test is the um, oxygen level and how we're gonna try to stop it. One thing we don't want to do is put hit their nose back, their head back, and let them um, clot off. Okay. Nursing care, been there, done that, right? And oral care is very important because that bacteria, you know, that blood, that dried blood, well, I don't want to say dry because it's in their mouth, but that blood in their mouth that can, you know, the bacteria is just going to love it. So we want to make sure that we do good oral care, okay? Especially if they have, maybe they do have a deviated septum and it, it, they have broken 
you know, that oral, that bacteria in the oral cavity can march right up into their nose and cause all kinds of issues. Okay, allergic rhinitis, we've been there, right? Everybody knows the difference. Remember with allergic rhinitis, we're expecting like clear, clear snot. That's the best way I can say it, clear snot, clear mucus coming out, okay? The biggest thing in this aspect is to keep, try to get people away um, from their triggers, okay? Um, there I go again, okay? We're gonna try to keep them away from their triggers. The weathermen always put out where the pollen is, you know, uh, you know what the pollen index is, so that patients that do have asthma that are asthmatic and allergic, they know to stay inside or to um, basically hibernate or to wear even masks. That's why they even have burning. Um, there's only special days that you can burn in the city due to the fact that you know pa patients, people are allergic to that and it can cause them to have allergic reaction. Um, the biggest thing is what antihistamines, uh, special nasal antihistamines, nasal, I don't wanna say antihistamines, they're nasal, um, nasal steroids. We wanna make sure with the nasal steroids, they don't use all these medications until they're totally clear. We want them to be able to breathe and that's how far we want them to use it for. But if we don't want them to use it for more, really more than five days, okay? Because of the fact that their body's gonna get used to it and they can have rebound congestion. So use it so they can breathe and they can do activities daily living, but we don't want them to use it too, too far in advance or for too long, okay? Remember, allergic rhinitis can be mixed up with um, just a normal cold, except that it comes about the same time every year. Some people have it year or all the time due to the fact that they're allergic to dust, dust mites, um, and animal dander. Some people are allergic to like uh, perfume, deodorant, that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, upper respiratory infection, that's what we usually call a common cold, acute viral rhinitis. It sounds a little bit sexier than just saying cold. Um, it happens September through January, but let's face it, it happens all the time. You can get a cold at any time. There's no rhyme or reason. There's no real, um, there's no cure, okay? We just treat the symptoms. Although people have been taking that, uh, what do they have? They have those different um, cold medicines that you take. I can't remember what they're called. I just saw vitamin, <sighs> coldies, um, things that when you start feeling like you have a cold, you take them. Um, airborne, right, to hopefully stop you, any colds that you have. And there's the signs and symptoms of a cold. Been there, done that, right? Now everybody's sitting there going between the cold and COVID. Um, you know, how can you tell the difference between cold and COVID? You know, far be it for you to cough at, um, in Walmart and everybody's gonna look like, oh, you got the vid, right? But there is a difference between a cold and uh, COVID. COVID is more of chest con congestion, whereas a cold, you're going to have the nasal or nasal congestion and sore throat. And generally, with the COVID, the biggest biggest signs and symptoms is the congestion and the loss of taste and smell. Okay. Last time I checked, whenever we have a cold, we generally don't have a loss of um, taste or smell. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Treatment, antihistamines and decongestants over the counter, rest in fluids, and then you have your herbal remedies. You know, you have your essential oils and everything like that. Zinc, vitamin C, all can help. 
Okay, upper respiratory infections of children. Remember, and I really don't have anything on this um, per se, but just know that kids can, they're more, they can have more severe colds due to the fact that everything's shorter, right? Um, their nasal passages are shorter and also smaller, so they can get clogged up a lot easier than what um, an adult can. Okay, characteristics. Everybody's different though. You know, they might be hyper as normal um, or they can just be irritable and listless. Okay. The biggest thing with kids though is when they start coughing, they're more apt to vomit. Okay. Because of their uh, shorter um, esophagus. I have like stink bugs everywhere. Like they're literally everywhere. Um, RSV, very horrible for little kids, young children. It's a virus. A lot of times you don't know that you have it before you're giving it to, to a kid. Um, it can be very deadly for smaller kids and with adults, not so much. It's almost, we can treat it like a common cold, okay? Spread by droplets and direct contact. Um, adult, same as upper respiratory infection. We can give medications. The prevention is um, RSV, IGV, and uh, or palazumab in children with lung disease. It's very expensive. Okay, so it's very select on who can get it, um, what insurances are going to give it. Influenza, flu, right? The flu, and it's coming. Um, a lot of people are scared with the COVID and the flu if we're going to have enough hospital beds. Um, really, it's not so much hospital beds, it's staffing right now. You know, is there going to be enough staff to take care of those patients is the big thing. Um, I think our ICU right now has 10. We hold 11, but they have 10 um, beds that are filled with ICU patients. Um, so it's, it's getting to that point where we're just not going to have the staff to handle the flu and the, um, COVID patients. So we're trying to get everybody to take the vaccine. Um, is it true when somebody sits there and says that they got the flu from the vaccine? No. Okay. It's not true. Um, but also remember that we can give um, the, in the live vaccine, but we're very careful who gets that live vaccine. So people that aren't immune compromised can have the live vaccine, okay? So you and I should be able to take the live vaccine and no problems. Um, Complications, increased risk of pneumonia, exasperation of COPD, anybody that has lung disease, COPD, asthma, cystic fibrosis, emphysema, um, all can have dire consequences whenever they have the flu. Um, also, not only with pneumonia, we have to be careful with the flu is that it can go into pneumonia. And if it goes into pneumonia, they could get septic and pass away because of that. Okay, another problem is cyanitis. Do, do, do. Okay. Prevention. I've been there, done that. When we're talking about prevention, we're trying to try the vaccine. If not because of vaccine, um, washing the hands, right? Continually washing the hands. And um, that's basically it, washing the hands. Okay. And hopefully, like everybody else, if you have the flu, you stay home. Medications, when this, well, I can't talk. Tamiflu, relenza. Um, remember, you have to start treatment within 48 hours of getting the flu. It does not stop the flu. What it does is it shortens the, the symptoms of it so that you're able to get back into working condition. Um, we can do symptomatic relief, acetaminophens, NSAIDs, antitussos, that kind of stuff. Any questions?
Remember with the flu, we're also going to do fluids, okay? So they're able to cough the junk up, okay? Cyanitis. Now, other than rhinitis, you have the cyanitis. The cyanitis is basically um, inflammation of the nasal mucous membranes, and you're going to have that nasty, thick, purulent mucous membrane, mucus, muc, uh, mucus, I'm with drainage, okay? Um, it can be viral, okay? Um, or it can be because of an upper respiratory infection. And you have that upper respiratory infection and what happens? The mucus isn't able to drain out of your nose and it just sits up there and the bacteria procreates, okay? And causes all kinds of problems. Um, and you have the contributing factors. And what are the people going to feel? Well, they're going to feel pressure, um, pain, okay, because of of the of the bacteria. Um, I mean, they're going to feel like crap, right? So if somebody comes in and says, you know, maybe two weeks ago they came in, they wanted antibiotics for their for their cold. Um, then they turned around and two weeks later, they come back in and say, you know, my cold's not getting any better. Difference, when they had the cold, it was clear, nice, you know, drainage. They were able to get rid of the mucus. Now they're having pain. They're having a fever. Um, they're feeling like crap. Okay, and their nose is just purling nastiness coming out of their nose. There's so now we can give them the antibiotics, okay, because now they have cyanitis. Do you, do you understand the difference? Okay, it can go into your common cold, can go into cyanitis. Okay, antibiotic again, you don't have to know which which antibiotic we're going to give, nasal steroids, we can do the saline irrigation, nose drops, and if they continue to have the cyanitis, we can do the surgical treatment, okay? We can get rid of those nose polyps, we can stop, can cure, get rid of that uh, deviated septum. Okay, tonsillitis, those kids can get tonsillitis. Come here. Hold up. Okay. Um, it can be fungal. It can be caused because of GERD. It can be because of those tonsil stones, um, lymph nodes, white patches. One of the main reasons, ways to get rid of it is, well, we're going to give you antibiotics, but then we're going to take your tonsils out. Of course, if you're an adult, getting your tonsils out are a lot worse than when you're a kid. I have to say at this point in time, I am not knock on wood. I'm not gonna get my tonsils out. I don't have any problems. I hope I never have any problems because what I understand it is a horrible surgery if you're an adult. Um, complications are abscesses, scarlet fever, rheumatic fever, and the rheumatic fever is because of that strep, okay? Um, or acute post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Okay, so it's basically in um, strep that goes to your kidneys. It goes systemic. What are we going to do? We're going to test swab it. Okay, and we're going to we can drain the abscess if an abscess does occur, um, but then we're going to have to do a tonsillectomy afterwards. Post-op, remember that swallowing, okay? That's a big thing is the swallowing. Um, ensure paint in the airway. Elevate the head. Liquid, soft diet. That's when you give them all the ice cream they want. Ice collar and warm saline mouthwashes. We don't want them to have Listerine, gargle with the Listerine or anything like that. We want it nice and we want the throat to heal. Okay. After a couple of weeks, what they can do actually is they get rid of their scab. Okay. And that's, a, that's a problem if it continues to bleed after that scab is um, gone. Okay. Epiglottitis and magical medical emergency. Um, epiglottitis can happen from anything. 
it can remember it's it can be viral or it can be because of infection okay bacterial so pneumonia okay there's an excess of bacteria so pneumonia croup could cause epiglottitis okay um so you could have a question of a complication of pneumonia a complication of the flu can be because of epi could be epiglottitis okay so um we have to be very careful with those folks so if a patient say a kid came in and he had croup um and he had he has strider um, he's in the tripod position to try to breathe. He's drooling. We can assume that he has epiglottitis. The one thing we don't want to do is sit there and say, well, let's see what your epiglottis, epiglottis looks like, okay? Because that can traumatize the, um, the, epiglottis, the, the epiglottis even more and cause it to swell, inflame, and then um, occlude their airway. Okay, the biggest thing we got to do is to get treat by IV antibiotics, um, and we're going to ensure their airway. If that's we have to give them a trach, that's what we're going to do. Laryngitis, the biggest thing is rest and fluids. Okay, it could be because you use your voice too much, um, or it could be just associated with an upper respiratory infection or um, the flu. Pertussis, what's the biggest thing about pertussis? Um, that's the vaccine, okay? Um, it's a whooping cough. Um, it, it paralyzes cilia in their, um, in their tra trachea and going into their lungs. Um, young infants have the risks for complications. The biggest things, you don't have to know the different phases, okay? I just want you to know the biggest thing is that it can be very detrimental to children and the only way we're going to stop it is for immunization. And everybody has to be immunized. Okay. Um, it is an isolated, we're going to isolate the patient, maintain fluid and nutritional intake. Any of these things, we're going to maintain nutritional and fluid intake. Okay. We're going to stabilize the folks the patients. Croup, you know, there's the viral croup and then there's the spasmodic croup that is basically GERD. Um, Bark-like cough, the biggest thing we're going to do is we're going to, um, we're going, biggest thing we can do is humidified O2, um, put them in the shower at home, you'll put them in a the shower and then take them out into the cold air, okay? It's going to help. Um, it's going to help uh, basal dilate and then basal constrict. Okay, and help them breathe better. High humidity, encourage fluids, and of course, if they're getting more restless, they're unable to breathe. Then we got to do something. Okay, sleep apnea. Okay, it's. Um, that's what the CPAP is for, is to keep those, those lungs open, the airway is open, and you need to know the signs and symptoms of it, okay? Snoring, um, it could be, I have it next, the next one, right? Yeah, manifestations, okay? They're not able to sleep. What happens is they go to sleep, and then they stop breathing, and they're, they go into that REM sleep, and then they come back out. And then they have to go back in. Okay, so that's why they're more tired. They might not realize it, you know, but they might not wake up themselves, like consciously wake up, but their body's waking up, and that's what makes them tired. Okay, periods of apnea, 15 to 20 minute seconds, um, personality changes, but it can be detrimental. Um, MIs, um, dysrhythmias, heart failure, sudden cardiac death, and pulmonary hypertension. What are we going to do? They're going to do a sleep study, and then we're going to get a, a CPAP. Um, they could lose weight, you know, not drink alcohol, maybe s sleep sitting up, maybe in a, a chair like a lazy boy, or their head of beds um, can be up. Some people put like books or something and elevate the head of their bed. 
underneath their their um, the posts of their beds or oral and nasal appliances. You'll see those breathe right strips, that kind of stuff. Or they can have a uvo pala palato ferroplasty, ferroplasty, a uppp, which I think is pretty drastic. If you ask me. Head and neck cancer. Okay, know the signs and symptoms of head and neck cancer and your risk factors. Um, you know, chronic alcohol use. If they just drink alcohol once, uh, once a week or once a month, that's not chronic use. Okay, chronic use would be, oh my gosh, these stink bugs. Where the hell they come from? I swear they came from Pittsburgh. Anyway. Um, Anyway, where was I? Oh, chronic alcohol, tobacco use, okay? HPV are all risk factors for um, head and neck cancer. Um, manifestations, okay? Remember these manifestations, we can explain away, right? But, um, you know, that's why sometimes we find out way too late um, for the head and neck cancer. How are we going to diagnose it? And then also the treatment, okay? Radiation, chemotherapy, and surgery is how we're going to treat it. The biggest thing with the, the um, surgery or any anything when we're talking about treatment is the loss of the vocal cords, okay? So we're going to make sure that we are able to um, communicate to them um, communicate to them, communicate, and they can communicate to us. We just can't assume that everybody can read and write. We can't assume that they're well, they can do it well, okay? Um, we also have to be there for emotional support. Okay, the partial, and I'm not going to ask the difference, uh, differentiation between the partial, the total, and the radical, okay? Um, I mean, the biggest ones that we really look at is the total and the radical, due to the fact that they basically, they're gonna have a trach, okay? Um, that their, their speech is lost, okay? That's the biggest things that you need to know. Okay, what pre-op are you gonna do? What pre-op teaching are you gonna do? Remember that we're gonna have speech therapy involved with them due to the fact that um, they're gonna to have to learn how to swallow again, they're going to learn how to possibly speak again. Um, and if they can't speak again, then they're going to um, have to use one of those voice boxes. Okay. Um, and they're going to have to get used to a trach. Okay. And know your trach care. How long you pre oxygenate before um, you do trach care. And how long do you how long do you suction for when it comes to trach okay the old wise the i don't want to say old wise tale um the old rule is to hold your breath when you're suctioning when you lose your breath and you find out that you have to breathe that's a good indication the patient has to breathe also okay um post-op Remember, we're going to do humidified O2 because we don't want to dry, dry out the mucus passages. And then your trach care. Is there any questions? Hold on. Let me see. Um, Anybody? Hold on, I gotta let my dog in. Go ahead. I guess they're sick of the stink bugs too. Yes, there will be ABGs on the test. And there'll be both kind. There'll be the ABGs um, that you have to solve, 
and there'll be ABGs like patient comes in and is unresponsive, has track marks on his arms, what are you gonna do? Okay, or patient has COPD, um, exasperation, decreased level of consciousness, what are you gonna do? Let's see. Okay, infectious, bronchitis. Um, again, I'm not asking you to know the antibiotics that we're gonna use, but you're gonna wanna know that, what are you gonna wanna know? That it is aggravated by cold, dusty air and the signs and symptoms. Okay, and generally we look at it to rule out pneumonia. Okay, increased fluid intake, cough serves for symptomatic rel relief um, over the counter, and then we're going to stress, let's quit smoking. Okay, pneumonia, know the difference between aspiration pneumonia and hospital acquired, and how are we gonna stop hospital acquired pneumonia? What are we gonna do? Okay, oral care instead of spirometer, cough, turn, cough, deep breathe, okay? Um, get them up, sit up, you know, sit them in the chair, get them walking, okay, are all things that we're going to do. I'm not going to ask you, like, what kind of bacteria or viruses or fungi are going to be involved, but, you know, the, oh, look, I didn't know I could do that. Learn something new every day. I don't like that, though. Okay. Um, you know, that everybody, that we want people to get the pneumonia vaccine, okay? Who's at risk for aspiration pneumonia? You know, patients that with NG tubes, patients that are decrease of, what is that noise? Decrease of oxygen, I guess it's a bird. Decrease in um, LOC, okay? Stroke victims, patients that have, a, um, a difficulty swallowing. Those are f folks that are gonna be more at risk for aspiration pneumonia. <laughs> Manifestations with your elderly, fever, tachypenia, decreased LOC, okay? Complications, we can do anything from atelectasis, pleural effusion, pericarditis, sepsis, or empyema. And then we have our lovely little, I really do like that picture. Nice, clear lungs. Those aren't so clear. The patient's gonna have a hard time breathing. Then you have some pleural effusions. And then there's your bat wing, your CHF. There is not going to be any x-rays on the test. And this is more like um, pulmonary edema. Dude, this person is going to have a really hard time breathing. Okay, Legionnaire's disease. Remember, it's from bad bacteria in standing water. It's not allergic, or I'm sorry, it's not um, contagious, but it is considered pneumonia, and we have to do some, we're going to have to give them some antibiotics to get them um, clear from this. Can be deadly. Mycoplasma pneumonia, um, basically walking pneumonia, it's really, can spread really quickly. Um, and I can honestly tell you, I don't think I've ever seen a question on this. 
aspiration pneumonia. We talked about that, or I talked about it. You guys just listened. And how are we going to diagnose pneumonia anyway? Generally, it's a um, chest x-ray that we're going to diagnose any kind of pneumonia. Um, we can do sputum. Remember, though, and I'm... It's going to be on NCLEX, it's going to tell you that you need to have a sputum um, to, you're going to have to have a sputum, you're going to have to have sputum before you can do antibi any antibiotics. And I'm going to tell you in real life, you're not going to be able to do a sputum um, before you start antibiotics or your patient is going to be dead. Okay. But for NCLEX purposes, you're going to have to get a sputum um, cross CNS, culture and sensitivity. Okay. You have to get the sputum first. You're not going to have to wait for the results, but you're going to have to get the sputum first. Does that make sense? Okay. Medications, we're going to use um, antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics for our patients. We can also use bronchodilators and mucolytics. If remember for anything, any kind of medication you're going to give, and if you went with respiratory, they hopefully told you that we're going to do um, bronchodilators before we do any steroids. Okay. We're going to do mucolytics so we can are able to cough that stuff out and expectorants. Okay, we're going to increase their fluids, incentive spirometry, chest physiotherapy. So that could be from hitting them on the back, you know, getting that stuff um, to be able to be evacuated out. Um, or we can do the chest from respiratory therapy. They have a, that vest. Okay, postural drainage. I'm going to tell them to maintain their fluid and to stop smoking. Okay. Okay, TB. Know what we need, what, you know, know what PPE you need when you're walking to a TB patient's room. Um, what are they supposed to be wearing if they come out of the patient, their room? Okay, their surgical mask. Okay, um, know your medications. Okay, manifestations. Fatigue, weight loss, it's night sweats. Okay, low grade fever in the afternoon are all signs and symptoms or manifestations. Okay, um, early detection. The biggest thing is, you might see something about the manitou, the intradermal PPD. that I don't, I can't remember seeing a question, but know your screening, you know, how you know you've been exposed, okay? Um, diagnosis, how are we gonna diagnose? Well, it's an acid base, acid fast bacilli, okay? We need a series of three early morning sputum cultures. We can also do a chest X-ray, but know your, how we're gonna get rid of it. And then it's a long process. It's not something that they can take for 14 days and then call it a day. Okay, it has to be six months. Okay, we're also going to make sure that their liver enzymes are okay because this medications are very hard for on the liver. So close monitoring for hepatic, renal, and auditory side effects. Okay. Then we're talking about infection control. Lung cancer is kind of similar to um, head and neck cancer. We're gonna do, we can do radiation, um, radiation chemotherapy. Uh, I don't have any questions on the different kinds, small cell, you know, carcinoma, squamous cell or large cell, okay? Um, diagnosis is a chest x-ray, 
a lung biopsy, okay? Treatment, chemotherapy, radiation, bronchodilators, analgesics, and then surgical um, treatment. Basically, when we're talking about surgical treatment, I'm looking at how we're gonna make sure they don't get pneumonia from their surgery, okay? I don't have the difference between a wedge and a segmental or a lobectomy. Okay. Post-op is very similar. Post-op thoracotomy is very similar to, um, to open heart, okay? They're gonna have chest tubes. We want them to have plenty of protein. Um, we're going to make sure they get up and cough and deep breathe and send a spirometer. Okay, any questions? I'm going rather fast, but I'm hitting the highlights. Definitely hitting the highlights. Okay, probably right in a mile a minute, 10,000 miles a minute. Pleuritis. Remember, with pleuritis, know the signs and symptoms of pleuritis. Okay? I'm going to tell you, you're going to see it. Okay? Um, know the treatment for pleuritis. You're going to see it. Pleural effusion. We can do a thoracentesis for a pleural effusion, okay? Um, you know, so if you do a thoracentesis, what are we gonna look at after a thoracentesis? We're gonna make sure the patient doesn't have a pneumothorax, okay? Um, they might have a little bit of drainage on, from their, you know, from the site, okay? Um, we're going to keep them in bed for at least an hour after their thoracentesis. But know your signs and symptoms of a pneumothorax, you know, tachypnea, tachycardia, um, decreased SpO2, and there's a pleural effusion. Treatment management, pneumothorax, know your signs and symptoms of a pneumothorax. You know, the dip, I mean, really the differences are kind of, kind of self-inflammatory. Spontaneous, something on the lung for, surface, ruptures and causes a pneumothorax. Um, open penetrating, closed and idiotragic. Okay, or the tension pneumo. Make sure you know the difference between a tension pneumo and a um, sucking chest wound. Okay, and what's the difference between a pneumothorax and a tension pneumo? Okay, remember a tension pneumo is definitely a medical emergency. Everything is gonna shift. Okay, remember, um, because, remember that goat's lung, okay, and how hard it was for that, for that lung to expand, okay? And what will happen in a human? Well, everything will be moved over. Okay, and the lung won't be able to expand. So look for heart failure. Okay, and decrease SpO2. Traumatic pneumothorax, CPR. Okay, could could be because of a traumatic pneumothorax. Things that happen, um, but kind of I wouldn't say close. Motor vehicle crashes, fall, CPR, fractured ribs. It could be um, a horse. You've fallen off a horse, okay? Open pneumo is a stab wound. And then we have the aerogenic weed caused it in the hospital. <laughs> manifestations, know the manifestations and know them like the back of your hand because you're going to need to know these, okay? Tension pneumo. Again, know it's like the back of your hand, the difference between what a tension pneumo would be versus a regular pneumo or a hemopneumo. Remember, a hemopneumo is blood. 
okay treatment we're going to use a chest tube okay or we might have to get a thoracotomy open it up okay but the first treatment is the chest tube to allow the lung to re-expand and then your chest tubes remember chest tube has to be below um below the chest just like your fully catheter um if we want to make sure they're not kinked if a patient is having decreased spo2 tachypnea tachycardia we have to figure out why they are having it well it could be because the chest tube um is coiled maybe they're laying on the chest tube okay um what happens if it's pulled out of a person's chest how are you, what are you going to do to ensure that that patient can be stable stabilized okay um how are you going to tell if there's air and there's an air leak remember the bubbling like an aquarium will show that there's an air leak um titling when a person breathes in and breathes out if they have a pneumothorax it should they should have titling so it goes up and down if they are healed and they don't have the pneumo anymore there shouldn't be any titling okay that shows that the that the patient has healed okay that the pneumothorax is resolved whatever chest tubes nursing care of the chest tubes remember you want occlusive dressing along with two um clamps at the bedside chest trauma rib fractures well with our rib fractures we have to worry about uh pneumothoraxes um, flail chest is multiple rib fractures and the chest wall is not stable we're gonna have paradoxal movement pulmonary contusions and medical emergency we are going to have them intubated in the icu until they're it can heal okay and it's usually 12 to 24 hours after the surgery so they don't come in from a car crash and we go oh they have a chest contusion we got to intubate them we have to look at their we have to look at their signs and symptoms we have to you know um diagnose and then we're going to be prepared if that makes sense that there it's a possibility treatment and care rib fractures we're going to splint and um, pain control remember we want them to deep breathe if any of these they have the, ha the rib fracture um they can have a possibility of pneumonia due to the fact they're not deep breathing okay because it hurts Flail chest, pain control, probably gonna to have to intubate them, and also pulmonary contusion, we're gonna intubate them. Okay, what else do we have? Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and sarcoidosis. I'll be honest, I don't have anything. And then our pulmonary embolisms where does it come from how are we going to treat it okay that's the biggest thing your heparin your lobinox your coumadin what's the risk factors please know this this because you're going to have a lot of questions on pulmonary embolus what are the manifestations of pulmonary embolus and then know your manifestations of fat embolus, which your biggest thing is your petechiae of chest and arms. Remember with a flat fat embolus, it has to be a long bone and it has to be broken. A long broken bone. So femur, hip, okay? It's not gonna be dislocated, it has to be broken. Diagnosis, how are we gonna diagnose it? Okay, D dimer, chest x ray, or I'm sorry, chest, um, CT, VQ scan are the biggest ones. And your medications. 
your fiber linux remember about the fiber linux what are going to what is it that we're going how can i put it what patients aren't going to be able to get tpa okay and well there's the contraindications right there Surgical, thrombolectomy, and a vena cava filter. You know, know the risks of having a um, pulmonary embolus. And how we're going to, well, how, when they're in the hospital, do we make sure they don't get pulmonary embolus? And then we have our management, frequent vital signs. We're going to make sure that the Fowler position is going to be high Fowler, oxygen. Okay, prevention, and then pulmonary hypertension. Remember with, unfortunately with pulmonary hypertension, um, patients, you know, they don't have a long, pro their prognosis is not good. There's types, there's primary, which is a survival rate of three years, and then you have secondary. Okay, which is because of its complication of chronic lung disease, sleep apnea, et cetera. And what are we gonna do with these folks that have pulmonary hypertension? Manifestations, well, it's funny, the manifestations seem like it's everything to do with not being able to breathe. Core pulmonale, we're going to look at not only respiratory failure, but we're also going to look for um, heart failure, okay, like your descendant neck veins. That's when you have um, continuous high pressure in the lungs. And then you have your diagnosis. There might be a couple questions on core pulmonale, nothing much um, on there. But basically, it's going to be like distended neck veins. The patient has a history of pulmonary hypertension. They now have distended neck veins, unable to breathe. You know, what's the diagnosis? And then treatment goals. What are, we're going to try to slow the course of the disease. We're not going to be able to cure them. We're just going to slow the course. Okay. And everything that we're going to do, we're going to give them vaso, um, vasodilators to hopefully get the get the fluid, get the blood off the lungs. Okay, boy, that was quick. Time is it? Oh, well, it's about the t that time. It was quick, but I gave you guys the highlights. Oh wait, hold on. Well, if the chest tube comes out, what do we do? Occlusive dressing on three sides. Okay, so remember, so when they breathe that in, the occlusive dressing goes like that. And when they breathe out, it goes like that. So it allows the air to um, escape, but not to bring any air into the lungs. That's why we have the occlusive dressing. What we don't want to, back in the day, they said to put a dressing on and to hold pressure, but we found out that just caused more problems. I went through it really, really quick, but I did give you the highlights, okay, of what could possibly be on, their, on the test. So now, go through your notes, look at what you know and what you don't know. Okay, what you're you're positive of and what you're not so sure of. Okay, and study the things you don't know. I mean, we've we've talked about we basically talked about pulmonary embolus. You know, the uh, what we're going to treatments of them a couple times already in this course. So you shouldn't have to spend much time about heparin and Coumadin and Eliquis and things like that, right? You guys that are outside, are you getting attacked by stink bugs or is it just here in middle of nowhere? Oh, you guys suck because they're horrible. I mean, they're like dive bombing me. You know, you don't want to kill them because then they stink. Although I've never killed one. I've just been scared.
Okay. So if you have any questions, I got to get going. I apologize. Duty, mother duty calls. If you have any questions, please, please don't be afraid to ask. Just after 10 o'clock, kind of lay low. Okay. Um, but, or you can email me instead of texting. But I should be available, hopefully, um, if you have questions tomorrow, give me a call. Or don't give me a call. Text me. And I'll get back to you. Don't give me a call. It'd be kind of weird. Okay? Bye, guys. Enjoy not having stink bugs flying around your head. Hey, I just got two in my bedroom. Oh, my God. Stink bugs. Okay. See you, guys. Have a good weekend. Or, good weekend. It's Sunday. Have a good Sunday. Bye. I don't know why. They they said they don't have any stink bugs. Why are you here in my room? What is that? And I look up and there's someone on my ceiling. Oh, <gasps> I found an exterminator. Dad, we gotta get rid of this.